is there any other person who wants to, to add something? Then we let the participants in. Okay. If there's none, I think then you can let the participants in. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, depending uh, on where you are connecting from. My name is Nadine Motoni. I'm uh, the ARSO project coordinator. And uh, I'm here uh, representing the Secretary General, Dr. Emogen Sengimana, who is not uh, uh, able to join us, but uh, he will be informed on the outcome of this webinar. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, today is the 32nd session of the Asomatri webinar series. And um, we are hosting it together with the Ghana Standard Authority. This is uh, from the new ASO rule as per the uh, council, uh, the ASO council resolutions uh, to be co-hosting these webinars uh, with ASO members. ASO members have shown interest in uh, uh, being more involved in uh, organization and conducting of these webinars. So the theme of today uh, is uh, the intra-African trade and the AFCFTA agreement implementation. The topic is on implementing harmonized standards for trade facilitation and sustainable development. Our moderator of today is uh, Mrs. Joyce Okore, who is uh, from the Ghana Standard Authority. Next. So ARSO is an intergovernmental organization. It's the African Organization for Standardization, which was established in 1977. Then you can move the slide. That was uh, established by the African Union, which was then the Organization of African Unity, together with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So the mandate of ARSO was to facilitate uh, African and global trade through uh, provision of uh, harmonized standards and conformity assessment procedures in order to address the technical barriers to trade in Africa. Uh, ARSO was funded uh, that time uh, by 21 member states, in, that was in 1977, but currently, we have grown, we have a membership of 43 African countries. You can see them uh, on the right side. And uh, also is being hosted by the government of Kenya and uh, our headquarters are in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Also is uh, responding to the, to the agreement establishing the African continent of free trade area specifically responding to the Annex 6 on technical barriers to trade. I can just mention three provisions that uh, give us that mandate. The members, the state parties, those are the countries that have ratified the, the FCFTA agreement, shall develop and promote the adoption and adoption of international standards and promote the adoption of standard developed by ARSO and AFSEC. AFSEC is the African uh, standardization uh, on uh, African uh, Electrotechnical Standardization Commission. The third provision in uh, the TBT annex is where a relevant international standard required to facilitate trade does not exist, requests the ARSO or the AFSEC to develop that required standards to develop, to facilitate trade between state parties. Um, the, today's um, plenary session, and the plenary session of the African Union Summit uh, in February, 2023 has 
um, decided on the theme of the African Union this year, which is the acceleration of the African continental free trade area implementation. There is, this is the reason why ASO has joined this African Union effort in uh, celebrating this year uh, during this uh, webinar. So the activity of this year will enhance existing collaboration among uh, different stakeholders, such as member states, regional economic communities, African Union institutions, private sector development partners, such as uh, in UNCTAD, um, ARSO, its member states through uh, their national standard bodies, and uh, all UN institutions, all um, continental Pan-African quality infrastructure, all continental uh, uh, financial institutions, and all that, including the consumers. Today, uh, you can see that we are together with uh, personalities uh, that will um, share with us um, some insights on standards, trade facilitation, and, um, and uh, continental uh, initiatives. We, as I said, I'm representing the Secretary General as the host. Uh, and here we have um, members from the Ghana Standard Authority who will represent uh, the Director General. We are together with Mrs. Joyce Okore, who is the moderator of today's webinar. And we are with Mr. Ruben Gisore, who is the ASO Technical Director. We have Komito, who is representing the UNDP. And uh, we have um, uh, Jessica and Kastan, uh, who will also be one of the panelists, and Engineer Daniel, uh, who will also be a panelist. Um, now uh, I, I, I can uh, see if we have our. Uh, the DG of GSA, who is the ASO president, if he's with us, uh, when I'm we with you, was... okay, I'm with you, you, Nadine. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, sir. I was not seeing your name. You are most. I'm welcome. with you I... and my chief of staff, George, you're holding the fort. But I wanted oh. to say a few words and then step into another meeting and enjoy at the end. My Thank, you staff, much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I can uh, let you in, welcome you to say a word, and uh, we can raise you for the other assignment. Thank you very much. Can uh, you take the floor, sir? Thank you very much, Nadine, and thank you, the ASO Central Secretariat, for organizing this. I noticed that when we started, we we're like 80 people. Now we are one, one, three people on this call. For me, that shows the importance that members attach to these webinars. Last week, we had the first ever AFCFTA Africa Business Forum. And that was in Cape Town, South Africa, from the 16th to the 18th of April. I think the key point is that we know that after is supposed to be a game changer for all of us. Uh, 1.3 billion people, three to six trillion economy potentially growing bigger and our interest is how do we use standards to promote trade if you look at a program i know there'll be country experiences from ghana and what has been done and other experiences one at us so we are happy that we have signed an mou with the afcfta secretary general and the secretariat the treaty is clear that also standards are the standards to be used in the AFCFTA. As technical experts and as leaders in our countries, I believe the question I want to pose to all of us is that how can we make AFCFTA faster and better? How can we work with our regulatory bodies to avoid too much red tape and to improve the ease of doing business? How do we ensure that we protect our consumers and our markets whilst at the same time facilitating trade and not becoming barriers to trade. Obviously, my job is not to give the answers because you are the experts. 
but I want to, I'm hoping that in this discussion, this webinar, we'll talk as an ASO family to find problems to Africa. But then we all leave knowing that we have contributed to making the ASCFTA work in creating jobs and making Africa a better continent for all of us. So I thank you all very, very, very much for your time. Um, I thank you for your important to for your and I will find very best. I'm called sometimes it could go on. Thank you very much. And for oh, all you are doing for your countries and for, did I drop off? Yeah, thank you. We, we, it Hello, was Nadine. breaking. Yes, sir. It was breaking. Sorry, there sorry. There are some few words that we didn't Let me just land. That. Yes. Yeah. I'll repeat them. I said, I want to thank you all for your contribution to job creation in Africa, for your support of moving AFCFC. And I'm hoping that at the end of this webinar, we all feel like we have moved ASCFCA better, I mean, forward faster, and that we have helped in both the job creation agenda, but also creating wealth for not just our countries, but for Africa as a whole. So thank you very much for joining the ASO webinar and for being part of the ASO family. And I look forward to all the discussions that will go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for the good message. And uh, we have noted so many things, good things that uh, um, we, are, we are all to contribute to the implementation of uh, the AFCFCA. No one should uh, um, left behind. Thank you very much. And uh, we noted that uh, we will be with your staff, uh, with your chief of staff and your team. Uh, um, now, as uh, yeah, I can continue after the president, uh, I can just continue going into the uh, background of the, on the AFCFTA uh, ratification benefit and uh, a, a few other things. Um, you know, I know that you may be following the AFCFTA news. Uh, we have so far a ratification of 46 countries. Um, this includes 35 ASO members. And for your information, uh, the, uh, the AFCFTA has started piloting trade among the state parties through its uh, guided trade initiative. It involves seven countries. These are Kenya, Rwanda, Cameroon, Ghana, Tanzania, Mauritius, Tunisia, and Egypt. These are the ones who started this journey and more countries are expected to join these ones. So, um, we note that uh, the scope of the FCFTA is large um, with strategies to reduce tariffs and non -tariffs, but the non-tariff barriers among state parties. So this covers some policy issues such as uh, TBT and SPS under their annexes on uh, six and seven respectively. So some benefits include um, uh, I have to say that uh, a number of studies have been carried out and forecasts uh, have been set for the increase in Central Africa trade due to the implementation of the FCFTA. Currently, uh, the Intra Africa trade stands uh, very low at just 14.4% uh, uh, of the total African exports. So this is from the UNCTAD, which predicted that the FCFTA could boost intra-Africa trade by about 33% and cut the continent's trade deficit by 51%. Also, the UNECA has predicted that the AFCFTA is expected to increase the intra-Africa trade by 52.3% by eliminating export import duties and to double this trade if non-tariff barriers, especially the technical barriers to trade are reduced. Uh, now the benefits, 
out of uh, different stakeholders. We have uh, benefits for pri the private sector and also to regulators and other stakeholders. Let's say the, the benefits for the private sector. The private sector, uh, mainly the African SMEs, uh, we note that the FCFTA uh, provides some uh, opportunities for industrialization by either creating a continental market and unlocking manufacturing potential. But in this regard, governments uh, must create enabling uh, conditions to ensure that productivity is raised to international competitiveness standards. We have also some benefits for regulators. Um, we can uh, mention that uh, regulators we just benefit uh, towards uh, a common regulatory framework. What I have to inform you is that the continental uh, quality infrastructure institutions uh, under the PACI, which is a forum of those four continental quality infrastructure institution, namely ARSO, AFSEC, AFRAC, and AFRIMETS. This is on standardization and accreditation on, on, on um, etrology, have put together a framework, which is a continental, an African continental technical regulation, a technical regulatory framework. This was in cooperation with the African Union and it was emanated directly from the Africa quality policy which was endorsed by the African Union head of state last year. So uh, member states regulators will benefit um, from this uh, framework, which means that all technical regulation will be uh, in one word harmonized. Now let's come to the ASO standardization work and initiatives. Uh, so far we, we have, uh, ASO has established 15 sectors of priority. And among those 15 sectors, we have uh, currently 85 technical committee. This was in cooperation with regional economic communities. They have together with also established these sectors as the priorities for the Africa. We have um, with member states, with experts from the member states, we have harmonized standards. As you can see in the first table, we have a total of 1,621 standards that are, be, that are published for member states to adopt, to withdraw their conflicting standards and adopt these standards as per the AFCFTA Annex 6. You know that, uh, you recall that ASO is the only, ASO and the AFSE are the only organization nations in Africa mandated to provide African standards. So in addition to international standards, the member states are required to withdraw their conflicting standards and implement these standards. You can see that um, there are some tari tariff lines that should be covered by standards, but also hasn't reached the, the total number of required standards to cover these tariff lines. So we still have some deficit. That's why we always mobilize uh, ASO partners, member states, so that we can put together our efforts to provide the necessary standard to unlock trade uh, among African countries. So Africa has a number of programs that can benefit member states. You can see that we have, apart from the standard harmonization committees, we have the conformity assessment committee, uh, which has uh, elaborated some uh, rules for, uh, for, for member states to adopt and schemes, certification schemes. And we have uh, capacity building programs. We have internet and uh, we have web um, uh, portals, uh, such as the African Trade Web Portal, where member states are finding all the trade related information among them, the regulations and uh, standards, if you want to trade in that country. We have also the, the consumer committee. We again contribute to the policy um, setting 
as, as I said, we contributed to the Africa quality policy, the Made in Africa, which is ongoing at the African Union level. We have all also had, um, developed an African uh, fourth industrial revolution standardization strategy. We always um, participate in uh, stating the, the, the stake talking on TBT and SPS issues in Africa. So we have uh, so many uh, policy that we, policies that we, we, we participate in and we contribute to. So those are the major ones that I have just mentioned. This one is now showing us how, um, where ASO is positioned. You can see that ASO is positioned as, a, as an African quality infrastructure institution, which is linked to international uh, institutions uh, directly to ISO and uh, uh, together with the, the sister institutions that are also linked to international quality infrastructure such, such as the um, IEC, IF, and OE, OE, OIML. And these ones are also linked uh, downwards to to Rex, to Rex quality infrastructure institutions, institutions and organs such as the the the, the Sadexan, ESC, uh, ESC uh, Scromet, and others. So uh, those are also connected to national quality infrastructures uh, institutions such as the uh, national standard bodies, national electrotechnical commission, um, national um, accreditation services and so on. Uh, so um, now we have uh, some emerging issues together. We are lucky, we are privileged to be with people who will share with us some, some insights. We are with um, Mr. Komito who has elaborated a SWOT analysis on the key emerging issues of the FDFD implementation. So, you will understand some key priority sectors of the CFTA, which are among others, agro-processing, automotive industries, pharmaceuticals, digital trade, and some services uh, such as transport and logistics. Um, so I can just introduce uh, the, um, the Ghana Standard Authority before we go into the panelists presentation. The Ghana Standard Authority is uh, a, one of the ASO member states and I can tell you that the Director General uh, of the Ghana Standard Authority is the current ASO president. You have, you have heard uh, his message uh, uh, just now. So uh, without going further, just know that uh, the Ghana Standard Authority was established in 1967. You can imagine their experience in providing solutions to trade. So I cannot go far. Um, the moderator will tell us more on the, the mandate of the, the, the GSA, which includes uh, the metrology standardization conformity assessment, where they provide testing, inspection, and certification to the private sector and other SMEs. So um, I can just uh, highlight that the main objective of this platform is this uh, webinar is to offer a platform for discussion on the FTA agreement. So let me, uh, without any further delay, let me call upon uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Joyce uh, Okore, who is our moderator of today, to continue um, with the, the program of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nadine. A warm welcome to everyone to this session. And uh, my name again is Joyce Okori. I'm the Acting Director Standards Directorate, Ghana Standards Authority. I will be glad to be your moderator for this session mm -hmm. and uh, not to waste too much time. I think I will want to introduce the first speaker that is uh, Mr. Rubin Gisori, the te Technical Director ASO. Um, Mr. Rubin Gisori is uh, the ASO Technical Director responsible for the coordination of technical programs with regards to standards harmonization 
and conformity assessment systems and resources mobilization. He joined ASO in 2012. He's a highly experienced um, individual on standardization and conformity assessment issues and strategies and their impact on integration, create sustainable economic development and world global economic agenda. He started his standardization profession in 1997 when he joined the K Kenya Bureau of Standards as a standards officer responsible for electrotechnical and renewable energy standards. I would like to introduce his topic, which is the AFCFTA priority sectors and the standardization opportunities, a review of ASO standardization initiatives. So we'll give Ruben the floor to give us insights into his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joyce and uh, Nadine for the introduction. I, just like the president um, gave us questions, I will perhaps not give you a lot of answers to the issues at the moment, but also to pose some questions uh, to us, because what we are looking at is uh, a continent that has decided to integrate, a continent that has decided to have a unifying agreement. And so we are trying to see why, what can we do to actualize what is written on the paper of the agreement uh, so that it benefits people. Because one of, one of the things that you'll encounter in this continent is that we have a lot of aspirations, we have a lot of ambitions, and we have a lot of expectations. Uh, but they hardly materialize to what we actually need. So, um, and that, that, that's the, those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. What happens, uh, you know, even when you dream, sometimes you work towards that dream. Uh, so when we have ambitions, do we work towards those ambitions? Or we just sit around and expect that those ambitions will materialize or uh, manifest themselves without our inputs? So that the, the thing is that, uh, uh, this is something we need to work towards, and we need to see how each one of us is contributing towards uh, getting what we expect. So also as introduced, currently as 43 members, as indicated, uh, it's a member-based body uh, that is intergovernmental, and therefore it is government that actually own the organization uh, through the national standardization bodies. The mission is to facilitate intra-African and global trade uh, through harmonized standards and conformity assessment system. So those two kind of approaches that uh, tell you that you, uh, you can harmonize the standards and when you do conformity assessment, that's when you actually achieve uh, the goal. So we have regional integration and this regional integration uh, in most cases, if you look at all types of regional integrations, there is one binding uh, uh, you know, thread, and that thread is trade. So the first thing you get is, is the, if you have regional integration, the first function is that it strengthens uh, trade in the region. The second one, it creates an appropriate environment for private sector development. Third, it creates the infrastructure programs in support of economic growth, uh, you are looking at an integration that basically at the end of the day uh, brings growth uh, to, to the members. The fourth is development of public sector institutions and good governance. Yes, and good these ideas of public sector and uh, good governance come in, in the sense that, you know, it's government that basically own the instruments of integration and the public sector is the one that serves everybody without a motivation for profit. Uh, so, and the fifth one is reduction of social exclusion and the development of an inclusive so civil society. So all players, we expect that uh, this kind of integration uh, creates an environment that does not 
you know, result in social exclusion, where certain se sectors of the society uh, do not participate, and where we expect that the civil society will thrive and try to champion uh, the issues of affecting the society. We're also looking at contribution to peace and security uh, in the sense that, of course, when we are doing business with one another, when we are trading with one another, when we are able to move around and visit each country, we create an understanding that you know, enhances uh, you know, um, peace. And then we are building our environmental programs at the regional level, uh, meaning, for example, that we have uh, cross-boundary environmental basins, if it is drainage basins, for example, rivers, uh, water bodies, uh, forests. Uh, we need to work on ensuring that we can have programs that uh, enhance or protect them at that level. And then strengthening of the region's interaction with the other regions of the world. Yes, we are saying we will do internal trade, but at the same time, how do we interact with the external uh, regions of the world? Because uh, the integration gives us an opportunity to be united and to face the world as one continent. Uh, so if you look at integration, uh, and I want to stress on that one because this is the one that you're going to be looking at. Uh, of course, the, the whole integration uh, looks at a, a number of indices that will tell you whether you're integrating or you're not integrating. But in this case, we are concerned more with the trade integration of which we have an average intra-regional import tariffs being reduced, you know, being affordable, share of intra-regional exports over GDP. So you, you can look at wh what amount of trade is uh, perhaps Tanzania doing with the rest of Africa as so opposed to external uh, countries. Share of intra-regional imports over, uh, over the GDP, and then share of intra-regional trade and how is the FCFT agreement working. So those are the dimensions we look at. And in this case, because we are trying to see how is the progress towards implementing the LCFT agreement. So we, we, we look at uh, the, the, what it does. The LCFT brings together five African countries. Uh, the population is between 1.3 and 1.4. We expect that it is growing. Currently, the combined uh, GDP of Africa is 3.2. 4 trillion as of 2016, you will see that this is very small. The intra African trade is currently at 14.4, and that's very low. But we expect that within the LCFT, this can boost trade by about 3% and cut the continent's deficit by 51%. So the deficit in this case is that uh, it would appear the continent is a net importer. Uh, so that when you, you are buying, you are importing more than you're actually exporting. And therefore, to pay for that, you have to uh, sometimes uh, surrender some of the, the, some of the uh, resources to uh, the countries that you, know, you are doing business with in a way that it's not balanced. Uh, the, the continent's free trade area can deliver considerable inclusive economic growth, uh, but it needs measures to boost productivity and expand opportunities. Uh, as these things will not come automatically. So uh, you can have that uh, very nice paper, which is very well signed, wonderful signatures, but at the end of the day, you have to really wait up and work so that you can get it. So uh, perhaps this kind of a, uh, a depiction in graphical sense can try to make us realize uh, what we are talking about. If we are, we are talking about the whole continent having an economy that is 3.4 trillion, that means it is very much close to India, which has uh, almost the same population, actually more than that population of Africa. So that's one country. But more surprisingly, it also means that a country like Japan, which is just uh, 150 million uh, people, has a bigger economy than the whole of Africa combined which gives them clout to, 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 to call our leaders to those meetings of theirs and give them some good lectures on how to manage the affairs of the continent. Um, you also look at, you look at others like, uh, you look at others like uh, Japan, I mean, uh, German, uh, 4.3 trillion. So that's bigger than Kenya, German has, 
80 uh, million uh, inhabitants. Uh, the one that is, has an exact, uh, you know, um, economy that is equal to the one of Africa is um, is UK, and you can look at UK is quite small, but that economy is bigger than uh, is basically the, the same as Africa. So what does that tell us? Tells us that we have a lot of uh, you know um, potential to grow, and we need to work towards. Uh, making sure that the continent can grow. Uh, if you look at the resources that are at the disposal of these countries like German, uh, Japan, or UK, uh, they are not comparable to what we have in the continent. And therefore, it makes us you know, uh, try to think, how then can we work towards ensuring that our continent can grow? So first, we need to look at what are the key things that make uh, economies grow. Mutual recognition for free movement is important. And if you look at those continents where they are doing a lot of business together, it is free movement, which is a key pillar for their success. And therefore, this is a key pillar in ensuring that uh, the LCFTA grows. This free movement of goods in, is achievable through mutual recognition. Uh, it can be enhanced by harmonizing uh, product marketing rules, coordinating market surveillance, and adopting content wide certification schemes for all industrial and tradable goods. So mutual recognition for conformity assessments has provided reduced the costs and greater efficiency uh, where it has been used. So uh, this goes all the way to ensuring that you can have uh, equivalence of technical regulations. And you will see that this is being um, worked on, particularly when you look at the African continental technical regulations framework that is being developed to ensure that we can have a way of you know, having our technical regulations not to be barriers to trade. Then uh, we, we look at the countries that are championing this mutual recognition. Uh, fortunately, we have here Ghana, we have Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. So these are champions in that sense. So once they have done uh, the document and they have reached a good agreement, it will kickstart the mutual recognition for conformity assessment a result in the continent, but this is scalable. So the other countries can join on and become part, party to those uh, areas. So where, what are the key priority sectors in the continent? All the studies that have been done indicate that these are the key priority sectors. You have agro processing, forestry and forestry products, uh, mineral products, chemical and pharmaceuticals, leather, leather products, textiles and textile products, machinery, tools and equipment, construction materials, petrochemical products, rubber and plastics, tourism, hospitality, and creative industries. And then we have knowledge-based services and logistics and transport. So if you actually look at this, we have not excluded any profession. Almost of the professions that you encounter in our countries are included. So if you look at the food, the agro-processing, that's the food and feed, fruit, vegetables, and all that. These are things that uh, you can agree that they are traded quite well. Where we are not doing a lot is, of course, when you talk of timber, and people think that timber and wood products, they are for not very advanced economies, but if you look at most economies, these are very key products. Then you have minerals, you know, the iron, steel, copper, gold, gemstones, and ETC. These are very key, um, you know, uh, economic uh, important, economically important uh, minerals. So we have quite a number of these substantive areas uh, that are the core uh, areas that have been identified after quite a number of studies that have been carried out in the continent. And therefore, it's important that we are able to develop uh, harmonized standards in that, that area, develop a quality infrastructure system that addresses all the facets that require these uh, sectors to be of benefit uh, to the continent. So what are we doing? The initiatives that we have we at ARUSO that are geared towards enhancing or exploiting these sectors. We have the harmonization of standards for in agriculture and food sector, including agro-processing. And we have uh, harmonization of standards for leather, textiles, and fashion. And uh, here we have to mention fashion because as for a long time, uh, people have assumed that there Africa does in our fashion, uh, but you have to agree that if you look backwards, you can see that our people actually were the first people to develop uh, textiles and leather products for use by humans 
as garments and other uh, items. So we are going back and we are going to look at uh, ensuring that we can have an identity through the fashion industry. And then we have African standards, uh, African standardization strategy for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so we are not left behind when people are talking of the modern systems that are arriving. Then we have African conformity, conformity assessment system, our program with certification schemes suitable to promote mutual recognition in Africa. So we, for a long time, have been depending on those uh, in external uh, certification schemes, but we are saying, yes, we do have uh, a different environment. We have different types of uh, products that do not have certification schemes at the international level, and we need to have them at the continent. And perhaps this will contribute to having the schemes being accepted at the uh, you know, international level. Then we are having, uh, you know, for manpower development or for human capacities development, we have training of auditors, trainers, and certification bodies to conduct certification, as opposed to the time when we have been depending on external certification uh, services. Actually, what we call the testing, inspection, and certification uh, by foreign uh, organizations. So uh, then we have a monitoring of standards for automotive industry and training for agro processors in value addition, entrepreneurship, and export processing. So uh, a very important area. Uh, the, the last point is very important, and you need to take note of it that we are actively looking at training people to understand how you convert. If it is a banana, you convert it to very many products apart from just having it as a fresh product uh, that when it becomes ripe, you find that you have to rush, run around looking for a market and ending up uh, you know, uh, throwing it away because you have not found a free market. We can have products from bananas that can last in the shelf for years. And therefore, if you have, for example, banana wine that can last for quite a long time, and that is desirable so that we can avoid importing things of chemistry uh, technology that is very simple, has been done in our continent for a long time, but currently we are not used, utilizing them. I thank you all. These are the initiatives that we have. We may not talk about them within this very short time, uh, but you are free to contact us to see what we have, visit our website to see what activities we have uh, that are contributing towards the implementation of the FCFT as well as the development of the continent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruben. This has been very insightful. And um, I'd like to highlight um, essential, the essence of regional integration and the five dimensions and respective indicators, including um, trade, integration, where standardization plays a key role, as well as Africa's trade performance over time, its share, in the global economy, mutual recognition of free movement, noting the priority sectors linked to Agenda 2063. And importantly, the ASO initiatives, which also highlights the harmonization of standards in the areas that are priority areas, conformity assessment um, programs, training of auditors, trainers, certification bodies, et cetera, as well as value addition of our products. So I'd like to ask you a few questions, two questions in fact. Which are the priority sectors for the AFCFT and why are they important with respect to trade and Africa's industrialization? And my second question would be, how do you leverage the AFCFT standardization opportunities to the development of the sectors. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions and uh, I appreciate. Uh, so if, if we look at um, the priority sectors and uh, why they are priority, there is what we look at the sectors in terms of what are the multiplier effects? Uh, what kind of catalyst do they provide? Uh, in terms of uh, growth. So if you look at the sectors that have been highlighted, for example, the agro processing, you notice that a big percentage of African uh, people uh, or, and even countries actually depend on agriculture uh, to a very large extent in terms of you know, GDP contribution. Uh, you find agriculture is, produ is 
on average, it is giving uh, a, sub, a share of around 32 percent uh, of the GDP of most of the African countries. And then you look at employment, it provides up to sometimes 60 to 80 percent of the employment uh, for many people in the rural areas of the, the, the countries, and quite a substantive number of them also at the, uh, you know, even in the urban centers. So this is this is the sector that you know uh, enhances food security as well as you know economic uh, inputs, foreign exchange earning, employment, and such, uh, such things. The same happens. You know, those are the the key. Uh, you know. Uh, indicators of what makes the sectors uh, to be priority. If you look at the textiles and textile products, for example, you find that even in the industrial revolution, uh, this was the key driver of the industrial revolution in, the, in, in Europe. And within the continent, we understand that it can actually act as a mass employment uh, activity. Uh, so uh, th 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 these are the, the ways it is looked at. Uh, so if you look at uh, the international profile of uh, the, the textiles and leather, you find that there are billions of money that are made out of it, and it is one of the biggest uh, sectors. But the continent uh, of Africa that can benefit a lot from it has the best climate to grow cot cotton, for example, and uh, other fibers that are utilized in the textiles is not using them very well at the moment. And therefore it is important that the sector is enhanced. And that's, that's why we are looking at having the standards that not only talk about the raw materials, but also look at the value added products like garments and the fashion uh, you know, uh, industry so that it can have that multiplier effect uh, of creating employment and prosperity for the continent. Now, when you look at the leveraging of the standards within the FCFTA, the, the issue here is that the standards are very important in terms of, uh, you know, making it possible for mutual recognition. And we are looking at the standards, reducing the number of standards you can have in the continent so that instead of having standards from 55 countries, uh, which are very different, you just have one standard applicable in all the 55 countries and that enhances uh, free movement of goods uh, across the continent. And therefore, that's why we are, we are seeing if, if the standards are used as a basis for technical regulations in the countries, or they are used for conformity assessment, then they enhance the possibilities of uh, free movement of goods. And hence that, that, that point of saying leveraging them within the FCFTA uh, can really work towards in, in creating an environment where our countries are freely trading with one another. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kisori. And um, I think the key words here are value addition, and then also the use of standards in technical regulation and conformity assessment is key. This, once we harmonize our standards and we can make reference to them in our technical regulations, and conformity assessment uh, programs, I think uh, it kind of removes um, the hurdles that we face in the region. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to move on to the second speaker. The second speaker we have for today is Mr. Komi Cho, who currently works as a regional advisor on AFCFT issues at the Regional Bureau for Africa of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. He's based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Before joining the UNDP, Kwame served as a regional integration, trade, and industrialization expert at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Ethiopia, and anchored in Geneva. He has a wide experience in the public and private sectors across Africa and uh, beyond. His topic today would be the implementation of the AFCFT agreement, the SWOT analysis, lessons learned so far, and the key emerging issues for consideration as countries develop and implement their national strategies. 
So I warm, warmly welcome Komi Chowu to deliver his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Moderator. Let me share my screen and uh, let me also make sure if you can hear me. Can you hear me clearly, please? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank my name you. is uh, Tommy uh, Chowu. I'm the regional advisor on EFCFT uh, for UNDP Regional Bureau for Africa. And in my role, I provide um, technical advisory services to, to uh, our country offices. As you know, UNDP has um, office in almost all African countries. Uh, but previously, I also worked with UN Economic Commission uh, for Africa, uh, where I have really uh, supported several countries develop their EFCFT implementation strategies. Um, the work I'm going to present today is uh, we have documented myself and one of my colleagues, Mahle Girma. Uh, who is now working in Accra, the secretary of the AFCFTA, we have documented based on our own interaction with countries, um, some of the lessons we are seeing uh, when it's coming to the implementation of the AFCFTA. And I will also speak briefly to the issues uh, the businesses are also uh, raising um, when it's come to um, standards, certification, and, and so and so. So um, as we know, I think this has been presented, I think, by Nadine as well. Um, a number of countries now have ratified the FCFT agreements. Uh, about uh, 40, 48, 46 have deposited the agreement. Uh, the agreement enter into force. Uh, there are some pending issues uh, that are still um, impeding some of the you know, uh, trading at large scale. Uh, but as you might know, or some of you might be aware, the AFCFTA Secretariat has launched um, a guided trade initiative, uh, which actually um, support commencement of trading under about seven, eight countries. Uh, but the idea is to showcase of those trading that are happening under the AFCFTA, then uh, uh, more countries now are also revising their national regulatory framework to start um, giving the preferential uh, treatment under the FCFT. Uh, but first, before going to uh, the kind of um, analysis I'm going to present quickly today, it's important to also note that uh, when you start creating a free trade area uh, and countries might not have room to impose tariffs anymore, the, the risk is high that they will use uh, non-tariff measures or non-tariff barriers such as uh, uh, TBTs and SPS and others to protect national market. That's why when Ruben also came in and saying harmonization, mutual recognition and port, I think this is quite key for AFCFT uh, to succeed. We want to trade among our countries, we don't want to trade low quality product. We want to trade quality uh, product, which is also um, a requirement increasingly by the increasing middle class of the continent. And also we, we see now increasingly farmers being linked to supermarket where uh, certification standards uh, are very important. So in terms of our work um, and experience working with countries, um, what is coming through the engagement at country level is that um, first, in terms of enabling factors of the AFCFT, in terms of strength, we have seen um, quite strong leadership. I might say leadership here because of the, the speed we have seen, the momentum between, uh, around the signing and the ratification. Um, the, the, the actually milestone of number of ratification, which was 22 for the agreement to enter in force was achieved in 2019. And then um, 1st of January, uh, 2021 was launched as official day to commence trading. So we have seen a number you know, of momentum, we'll say great momentum around ratification. Now, when we go to the technical level now, um, at the country, are we also seeing the speed in implementing, that is not yet there. So there is still a gap, but we do believe because this is also a new uh, trade agreement. 
Another, I think, area of strength in many countries is establishment of strong national FCFT committee. And uh, we have example of Cote d'Ivoire, we have example of Ghana who have set up the, an EFCFT dedicated national implementation committee. We have it in Togo, in South Africa, and many other countries. In some countries, the decision has been made um, to include the mandates of the EFCFT committee in existing trade facilitation committee, which is totally clear. We don't need to systematically create several committees. Of course, another area of strength, again, when it comes to countries' uh, effort toward implementation is that number of countries still have trade promotion and industrialization strategy. These are framework that exists. We also know that um, African countries have strong experience uh, on free trade area, whether at regional level, the RECs, or, or at continental or at international level. So a uh, free trade actually is not new for the continent. But again, we, we as uh, I think Robin and Cole have said, uh, there is still issues when it comes to implementation. Um, of course, natural resource and domain with the continent, uh, I cannot say it anymore because it has been said and we all know uh, that we have abundant resource, which actually could help us really if we are able to break those uh, barriers, uh, whether it's trade, non-trade barrier, and so and so. And the FCFT is, is here to create that uh, market integration. And uh, one also area that we have seen in countries that the, the private sector capacity uh, sometimes some people are surprised to say, oh, African private sector have strong capacity. Yes, they have. I've seen in, in country like Guinea, where a local investor have been able to set up um, a factory to make bread, juice, and others have diversified not a lot. We have Dangote, we have a number of entrepreneurs, but of course, under the FCFT, we want to have more of the Dangotes. Now, um, the second point in the SWOTS, strength, uh, weakness, and opportunity, and um, treat analysis. Now, what are, what, what, what are we seeing as opportunities? Of course, uh, when you, you remove barriers to trade, we, the consensus at country level now in, across the continent is that this creates potential for new or expanded business and, and our market opportunity especially beyond existing REC that are, you know, custom union where uh, uh, tariff is already reduced. So some countries are really looking into how to access those extra uh, regional uh, markets. We have across the continent, um, large economies. We have three countries, I think, with more than 100 million population. We have Nigeria, we have um, Ethiopia, we have Egypt, which have huge population. We have other countries as well, where population are more than 50 million. So we have those large regional markets. Now, when we have those markets, the economies behind the small economies would like to position themselves as well uh, as trade hub toward those, those markets. Uh, for instance, um, some of the example when we take um, today automotive sector, um, as you know, in South Africa has quite a vibrant automotive sector, but you have countries like Botswana and um, Lesotho, which have been able to supply leather or textile for the seats of those, uh, uh, those um, uh, 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 sectors, those sector in uh, auto, auto sector in South Africa. Um, and so and so, uh, we also have agro-food products that can be processed, whether in countries that are closed, for instance, if you go to West Africa, Central Africa, why can't we process um, plantain, for instance, that is grown in Cameroon to supply Nigerian market under the AFCFTA, since both Nigeria and uh, Cameroon are not part of the same regional economic community. So these are some of the things that are coming. Opportunity also to add more value Actually, when we look into the intra-African trade structure, uh, it's clear that African countries trade more value-added product with, with, with ourselves, and while we continue to trade more commodities with the rest of the, the continent. So the FCFTA normally should, should 
quite give us a push and reduce, as you know, the continent's dependency to the volatile international commodity markets. Um, the opportunity that the FCFT, because there is also a dispute resolution mechanism, which has not been found in any of existing uh, trade agreement. So the dispute resol resolution mechanism is there to really support um, compliance, but also when there are issues that are raised among states, they can also address them through a quite strong, well-designated dispute settlement system. And of course, there are several operational tools. We can't go into those details. There are tools, online tools to report non-tariff barriers. Um, there is um, this mechanism by a flexing bank called PAPS, uh, which is uh, actually a payment uh, system to for countries and importer, for instance, or exporter in country in one of the African country to transact with the importer in another African country in local currency. So both can use their own local currency, and there is a mechanism at continental level to make the transaction using uh, exchange rate. So yes, I can be in Nigeria and pay today my uh, uh, importer or exporter, sorry, in, in Ghana, in, in uh, Naira. And, you know, uh, uh, I will, I, and he also will, or she will receive uh, what my transaction in, 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 in Cedis. So the PAPS is there. There are also uh, tools for rules of origins. And so, so those are opportunities and others that are here. Now, what's, what are we seeing as impediment to the AFCFTA uh, implementation at, uh, based on, again, our own experiences? Now, we still have limited awareness or ownership of the AFCFTA agreement. As I said, I'm saying it now, only few countries, seven, eight, have taken steps to revise their regulatory framework to start implementing uh, all the, non, the, the tariff or non-tariff measures on, on the FCFT. And here again, when it's come to uh, TPT, SPS, the role of ASO will be quite determinant to help countries implement those annexes that uh, I think Nadine and Ruben has uh, indicated. We also seeing, as this has been said, inadequate regulatory and institutional environment. Uh, when it's the whole, not only standard, but the whole areas of quality infrastructure systems, um, huge gap at many countries in terms of institutions. Ghana has a quite strong uh, agency for standards. You go to other many countries, whether the, 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 the agency might not exist or not functional. Laboratory, we, of course, promotion of regional laboratory is the way forward since we don't expect any, all the, each country to spend a lot and invest in, 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 in big laboratory. But it's important, last few weeks ago, I was in Comoros. They produce a lot of fish, but they don't have any single laboratory to do the small, the minimum testing to be able also to move to the next steps. So it's not because we are going to trade within our continent that we don't need them. It's important. Uh, increasingly, quality is, is becoming a requirement from consumers. So it's important to help countries uh, harmonize, but also, if possible, some of the regional hub to also set up or establish those laboratory. Uh, the, 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 there is also issue around, as you know, a weak production and trade support infrastructure. It's important because no one among us will just buy a product from the continent because it's made in Africa. We buy because it's quality and it's cheaper compared to what we can get elsewhere. And these are energy costs, transportation costs, and so and so will be very important for the AFCFT to, to benefit. That's what is coming also from both policymakers and uh, businesses at, at country level. I already said uh, the quality infrastructure system framework is still weak in, in many countries, but we have seen also um, quite of um, some improvement uh, uh, in, in many countries. Social economy and political instability, we all know, uh, Sahel region. Uh, so with those 
and security in those regions, it will be difficult to, to, to promote intra-African trade, right? So we shouldn't forget that uh, these are also potential impediment. If you go to Mali and telling someone, oh, you can trade easily across uh, border while the person is you know, suffering uh, or threatened by his insecurity in the region, that person will not believe in, 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 in you know, scaling up trade. And this is also post risk into investment, as we all know. We still have high prevalence of informal sector. And the FCFTA is a trade agreement. There, there is no, so far, there's no simplified trade regime under the FCFTA. So there, there should be ways you know, to really bring those informal players into formalization uh, for them to be able to also uh, um, trades within the continent. This also will, of course, mean that those pe people today in the formal sector need to comply with those standards as well that exist in the high value added segment of the, the value chain. Of course, issue around finance, productive assets is still huge, and this is also coming a lot from, from countries. Now, in terms of trades, um, to the AFCFTA uh, success. Of course, one of the key is uh, short-term cost adjustment. That's why some countries are not you know, speeding up on implementation because uh, they are afraid of losing some revenues. Although it's limited, the, the, the risk of region of short-term cost is there. Adjustment costs will also mean that you know, uh, uh, with competition, some of the sectors in some countries that are less competitive will disappear, right? Um, so free trade area also mean increased competition. And then we need to prepare the businesses to be able to respond to the increased competition. There are also risks around non-compliance or non-enforcement of the FCFT rules by some partners, you know, trade partners. Um, for instance, bringing rice from a country outside the FCFT, outside the Africa, put them in a bag in the continent and put that this is made maybe in these countries in Africa, it's, not, it's wrong. But there are, there's still some risk. How do we make sure, uh, when it's come to compliance, how do we make sure that uh, those certification agencies have, are doing the right test to deliver. So these are some of the risks also the private sector uh, is, um, is a bit you know, afraid about. Of course, they are concerned about lack of harmonization. I think Ruben has said it. And access work in that regard is, again, important to harmonize or to promote mutual recognition uh, because it's become very costly for businesses to start paying in each of the country they want to to ship their goods to. There are a lot of examples. And last week in uh, Cape Town, uh, during the FCFT Business Forum, this is also we have discussed with a number of, of businesses. Of course, we know there are still overlapping membership of Rex, and this is also uh, sometimes uh, businesses are lost in terms of which trade regime to use and, 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 and so and so. So support is also needed there. Uh, there, there might be also misalignments. Uh, between AFCFTA and other trade agreement, especially when it's come to the extra AFCFTA partners, those partners beyond the continent that are still signing bilateral with those AFCFTA partners. So it's important to also uh, make sure that um, those businesses have to be aware and when they are trading, whether to AFCFTA or AF extra AFCFTA, uh, they have to, to know. Of course, we still have those external shocks. Um, COVID was the recent one and others. Um, so the issue of COVID, um, after COVID, countries are now a, a bit reluctant to open their market because they need any one dollars that will come from tariffs. So some of the countries are delaying actual implementation of this uh, agreement. And of course, uh, when we look into the countries, you know, you, we, we have winners. Uh, quick winners, those that have a quite relatively strong industrial structure, uh, but others that will, at, in the short term, will be, you know, cons consumption markets. But the idea is that countries could find where they can position when it comes to regional value chain to be able to, to win. So these are some of the key, you know, um, issues when it comes to strengths, opportunity, weaknesses, and traits. 
that are coming from our own experience in supporting countries implement this disagreement. So we at UNDP, uh, we are supporting to the realization of an inclusive and AFCFTA under two key uh, uh, pillars. First is how do we build more competitive business, especially MSMEs. And uh, one of our key areas of support is to invest also in compliance uh, to a standard certification and, 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 and so, and also support the regulatory framework. And in that regard, we are also looking very much forward to work with, with ASO. We have some preliminary discussion with ASO in Cape Town, and we hope to, to follow up and uh, work with all our UN sister agencies to support an integrated uh, AFCFT implementation. I will stop there, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chow. Um, your presentation has uh, brought forth um, to us the enabling factors for achievement of the AFCFT objectives and the potential impediments to address. And you highlighted on the strengths using the SWOT analysis. And uh, I picked um, critically the political goodwill. This is what we can also leverage on the existing of a national AFCFT committee, of which Ghana has one, is also very crucial. Trade promotion, industrialization strategies, then availability of natural resources. Africa is well endowed, but there's a need for value addition and then building private sector capacity. These are strengths that Africa can take up seriously whilst we are looking at all the weaknesses. Let's focus on our strengths and the opportunities that you've outlined, which are vast. We have the potential in the intra-African trade and the market opportunities, the large regional markets offering opportunities under the AFCFTA, increased diversification, which is linked to value addition, Value addition keeps coming up. So we need to move away from the raw material and try and add value to our products to make them more competitive. And then also it reduces our risks. And then uh, you touched on the dispute resolution mechanism as well, which is indeed very important. Um, you've outlined quite a lot of weaknesses. I would not go too much into it. <laughs> but I'm thinking that... Um, Let's focus on our strengths and also opportunities which are fast. Um, I would like to ask you two questions. You noted quite a lot, but what would be the key challenges you'd like to highlight as arising from the implementation of the AFCFT by the state parties? And my second question would be, what are the key emerging issues and lessons learned so far? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. So to, to summarize a bit, in, in terms of key challenges, especially when it's come to, to standards, uh, first, uh, I think we all agree that implementation is key and uh, uh, we need to work more and support country at all level. I think the private sector need to advocate all institutions uh, because we do believe, I think as an African personally, I do believe that we need to integrate more our, our, our market. So we need really to, to really advocate for implementation. Uh, second, when it comes to standards, um, the key issue, again, I think as raised by colleagues was that uh, we're still facing a lot of issue when it comes to uh, convergence, uh, which means mutual recognition and again, you know, harmonization and so and so will be important. Uh, taking them probably at prioritizing some of those those sectors. We know it's costly, but we also need to invest. And uh, there as well, uh, financial resources, uh, availing financial resources, whether from the private sector, from the government and other partners will quite be, be uh, important. Now, uh, the emerging issue and, and some lessons, I think, as, as I said, in some countries, the AFCFT uh, committee are quite doing great work uh, to make this happen, actually. Uh, but, you know, some of the, those committees do not have the resources 
uh, when it comes sometimes to the inclusiveness of those committee, they are not that inclusive. Sometimes you see the Minister of Trade only driving, uh, but they don't have all the expertise, you know. Uh, when it's come to agricultural products, SPSS and others, they need to work closely sometimes with the Minister of Agriculture or the standard um, agencies. So which is important. So we are also seeing this, for instance, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana systematically, I think they take integrated approach. So some of the lessons learned. Um, I have also talked about the guided trade initiatives. Some of those countries, for instance, that has been shipment between Rwanda and Ghana, Ghana, Kenya, under the AFCFTA. And those trading were able to reach out to their national uh, certification body to be able to get you know, uh, uh, support, technical support and others to comply with the rules and regulation or standards in the, in the destination countries. So we can learn from those that are trading currently and of those countries that are part of the guided initiative and advocate for more countries to join. So I will just uh, uh, um, stop, stop here, uh, but uh, thanks very much for those uh, follow-up questions. Thank you very much for your submission. And uh, I'm sure we've all picked quite a lot from what you have um, submitted to us. And uh, we will take all the necessary steps to um, improve our processes. So we'll move on to the third speaker. She is Mrs. Jessica Nkansa and works with the Ghana Standards Authority as the director of the Inspectory Directorate and is responsible for all exports and imports which fall within the mandate of Ghana Standards Authority. She's the head of the competent authority for fish and fishery products and a system auditor for international standards that give international credibility to the practices of the organization in question for Ghana. So her presentation is going to focus on piloting the AFCFT agreement in African countries with specific initiatives and policy recommendations, the national experiences and strategies. Thank you. So you're welcome, Jessica. Thank you very much, Joyce. Um, let me just try and share my screen before I start everything. Okay. Jessica, can you forward your presentation to Dan, if it's possible? She, she's trying to share his screen. Hello. Yes, Jessica. Can you hear me now? Yes, but um, your screen. We are yes, yet the power. <laughs> if you can forward your. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you very much. So you can go ahead. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Um, with your kind permission, I'll just stand on the protocols that have been already established. Um, as Joyce said, uh, my name is Jessica Nkansa from the Ghana Standards Authority. And as you all know, Ghana is the host country for the permanent secretariat for AFTA. And we've been very pivotal, uh, well, we have a very pivotal responsibility to ensure that the consolidation and the implementation of the AFTA agreement moves on very smoothly. Um, and to be able to do this, we Ghana has developed a national AFTA policy framework and action plan. 
um, the team had to consider or rather go through a very comprehensive process of data analysis as the basis for developing this policy framework. There was also intensive consultation with stakeholders, all with the context of increasing Ghana's share in intra-African trade. The Secretariat, which hosts this, is close to GFP, but is also closer to the Ghana Export Promotion um, Agency Authority, which hosts the Export Trade Hub. And this trade hub provides information on export requirements to potential um, exporters or even people who are exporting for them to know what the requirements. And this export hub is manned by um, trade relevant government agencies, such as the Ghana Standards Authority, the Food and Drugs Authority, PPRSD, which is a plant protection and regulatory, regulatory services directories. Um, the Ministry of Trade and Industry has oversight, is the oversight ministry for Ghana's participation in AFTA and the focal ministry, of course, for AFTA negotiations. The minister chairs the Interministerial Facilitation Commission Committee, which we'll see in part two when we get down further. Ghana Standards Authority is under the Ministry of Trade and Industry and is one of the key implementing agencies. However, I would also want to say that there are other agencies that take part or are involved in the implementation. So this is the National After Policy Framework and Action Plan, which was developed for Ghana. And we'll just go into it briefly. This is what the cover page looks like. And as you can see, this policy framework was developed in August, 2022. So it is quite new, but it is very, very insightful with a lot of things in there. Now, this policy framework is structured in five play, uh, parts. Part one, which is what is showing now on the screen, is the National After Policy Framework, and it provides broad guidelines for concrete actions in support of Ghana's implementation of the AFCFTA. Now, there are seven components in this part one. It talks about the components are um, Ghana's trade policy, trade facilitation, trade related infrastructure enhancing productive capacity, trade information, trade and development finance, and then market factor market integration. Now these are, the, the components are quite heavy and for lack of time, I may not be able to describe them into detail, but each of these components has the following a defined strategic objective or defined strategic objectives. And then there are also policy descriptions for each component, which spell out government's responsibilities. So the expectations of government have been lined out under each and every one of these components. It also comes with a system to ensure that the implementation of these strategic objectives are executed. And the outcome has also been defined or the expected outcome has been defined. And this is such that the evaluation of the extent of implementation can be determined. So this is what it looks like. And I'll just use one of the objectives as an example for you to see. So the objective is to incorporate after rules and regulations into the laws of Ghana. And the expected output from this objective is for after rules and regulations to be mainstreamed into national laws. Now, how do we um, hope to achieve these inputs? So, so as not to leave it to be done arbitrarily, there's an objective output, the activity which is expected. So for here, it's a, um, the review of relevant AFCA um, instruments and other proposals 
for adjustments. The key performance indicators that will be used to measure its implementation are the number of relevant instruments reviewed and the number of proposed adjustments. Now, the means of verification or the objective evidence that would show that it's been done will be the copies of instruments reviewed which are available, and then the proposals for the review of relevant instruments that are also available. There's a timeline to it. So by quarter three of 2022, this is expected to have been done. Now the implemented agencies have also been identified. That's the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the Ministry of Justice and the um, Attorney General's Department. So they are responsible for this, this um, activity. There's also the identification of national laws and regulations that needs to be updated to comply with the AFTA requirements, our agreements. And this is an activity that has to be carried out. The KPI is the legal team set up to identify this Relevant, the relevant laws and regulations. And then the objective evidence as um, that shows that it's been done will be the report of meetings that have been held. This is also due, was due in quarter two of 2022. And again, the Ministry of Trade and Industry was responsible for this. So each of these con components has the, um, defined KPIs and how it should be structured. And it's been done for all the seven components that were under part one. For part two, there are also six components and there's the interministerial facilitation committee, the Ministry of Trade has also its, its responsibilities. There's dispute management or resolution also under the Ministry of Trade's um, responsibilities. There's also the National After Steering Committee, the National After Coordination Office, which is doing very well, steered by Dr. Fari Jatha. And then there's a stakeholder engagement, which have been going on. Funding arrangements have also been defined. Part three is on communication strategy. Part four is on the monitoring and evaluation of whatever the requirements they've put in there. And then part five is on the detailed actions, action plans. Now, the overall objectives of the policy framework in the um, action plans as determined there, we have six points, which are the overall objectives. The first one is to provide market access opportunities to existing and new markets for Ghanaian goods and services. The second is to promote the development of new products with export potential. And I remember the first and second speakers were speaking about um, value addition and all these come under this, this, uh, this, the objectives that have been detailed here. We also aim to stimulate increased demand for made in Ghana goods and services. And for this, I couldn't help but put in the made in Ghana logo in the middle of nowhere there to show that it, is, it has started, it's in high demand. People are applying for the use of this proprietary mark, the made in Ghana logo. There's also the provision of timely and accurate information on market trends as an objective. And then the promotion of the development of innovative financial products for trading in Africa. And the increase in value addition for Ghanaian goods for exports to the rest of Africa. Now, to be able to implement the whole policy, there's a five part plan. The first one is the national after policy overviews some of which I have described already. And then there's the in, in, to institutional arrangements. So under the institutional arrangements, we have the Interministerial Facilitation Committee, the National Steering Committee, Technical Working Groups, and the National After Coordination Office. 
And all these are working to ensure, to ensure that institutional arrangements have been made and are working well to ensure that government agenda is pushed forward. There's also communication and advocacy as part of the plan, monitoring and evaluation, because as the plan progresses, we need to make sure that everything as done, as expected, is being monitored and evaluated to ensure that what is expected, the expected output is what we are getting. There's also the National Action Plan for boosting Ghana's trade with Africa. And there are many committees under this plan, which are meeting regularly to ensure that Ghana's trade with Africa is boosted. This is just a screenshot of the five pan pl part plan that we um, I just des described. This is just a summary of the things that are within our policy. The policy is publicly available and it can be accessed through the Ministry of Trade and Industry website. It is free and it can be downloaded for more. It's a 60 page document which will give you more insights as to how Ghana is managing its, its um, implementation of the after agreement here. I would like to end by saying that um, the national after policy for Ghana has been very, very um, insightful or instrumental in defining the paths that Ghana would have to chart in achieving the overall objectives as lined out there and increasing the volume of trade. There's a very common proverb which says that if you do not know where you are going, every path would lead you there. But this policy is guiding Ghana to be able to take systematic steps to making sure that the KPIs that they have put in place are met and that they would achieve the objectives as needed. Thank you very much. Over to you again, Madam Moderator Joyce. Thank you so much, Jessica. Indeed, this has been a very, very, very insightful presentation. And uh, it's a good overview of Ghana's um, experience. Uh, indeed, Ghana is the host country for the AFCFTA, which is well noted. And uh, you, you touched on the national implementation policy strategy for increased participation in inter Africa trade, gave insights into the national AFCFTA policy framework and action plan. It's highlighted Ghana's um, AFCFTA trade policy and its objectives, including incorporating the AFCFT rules into the laws of Ghana, that is very insightful. And we took note of the various components in the various parts, uh, part one, part two, et cetera. But I'm sure we've all taken notes and um, that would inform us if we have to replicate what uh, Ghana is doing. And um, we looked at the, the overall objectives that um, includes the provision of market access opportunity, which is key because um, that is actually going to drive the SMEs to produce innovative products and then add value to their products to be able to reach the global market. And then uh, to promote, promote development of new products well with export potential, the focus will be export potential to derive um, foreign exchange. And then uh, to stimulate demand for the made in Ghana goods and services. And believing that um, member countries can take this initiative seriously because uh, it serves as a leverage to then move on to Africa. And so if you introduce something, I mean, within your, your countries and uh, people become accustomed to the certification processes and then eventually getting the made in maybe, uh, Ghana or any other country uh, logo, which is also a market tool. And uh, you also gave us insights into information on market trends 
and then I think financial arrangements. And the other key um, item you, you, you dealt on was the institutional arrangements. That's also very critical because uh, you need these um, arrangements to actually drive the process. So every committee is responsible for one activity or the other, and uh, it makes the process more effective and efficient and not uh, forgetting the monitoring evaluation of the processes, how you are faring with the implementation and not forgetting the bottlenecks that are obviously you would encounter. Uh, overall, I think it's been a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, presentation um, given the, the Ghana's experience because that is what people are going to take home to try and emulate what Ghana is doing. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have two questions for you. You probably have touched on it a bit, but if you can just give us the key areas, which is um, what are Ghana's priority sectors as a piloting country of the AFCFT? So, and the second question would be, what are the, some of the key challenges in the piloting that Ghana is facing? Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you very much, Joyce. Um, so in preparation for the um, trading that we are envisaging, there are some several ongoing um, government initiatives that have begun to hold Ghana in readiness for after. But key amongst these, I'll touch on four areas. Um, we have the 1D1F or One District One Factory Program, which started in two, 2017. And it is one of the government's uh, key, key components to point industry in the, in the way of industrialization. And its main, its, its main aim is to transform um, agencies from being agrarian or from Ghana being an agrarian of the economy to us being an industrial industrialized economy. There's also the strategic anchor programs that has begun. For that one, when we talk about the strategic anchor program, there are so many different um, areas under it. We have the pharmaceutical industry, we have the food and fish industry. We also have some integrated aluminum factories or industries under that. There's the steel and iron, automobile and vehicle assembly projects. There's the textiles and then the garments or apparel manufacturing areas as well. Then industrial salt, you know, we have a lot of salt here in Ghana, petrochemicals because of the oils that we have here, we have discovered. And then manufacturing of machine and machine parts or components is also part of it. Then industrial starch made primarily from cassava and then the oil palm industry. These all will come under the strategic and anchor um, industries. We also have the construction of regional parks, industrial parks, and also the special economic zones that um, are being put up. And then there's the NEDS, the National Export Develop Strategy, which is being pushed by the uh, Ghana Export Promotion Agency. And then we are trying to move our export market value from 2.8 billion in 2020 to 25.3 billion in 2029. So in here, there are so many different strategies that are going to help manufacturers, processes, and everybody within this value chain to be able to access markets that they will be able to they'll trade with. So these are mainly the areas that we have prioritized as a country for after, for now. For the challenges, there are so many, but I'll just touch on a few. Um, one of it is, does industry understand standards, standardization, technical regulations, technical barriers to trade? So all these are things that we have to sensitize people on. We have to do a lot of education 
to bring everybody up to that level where they would understand what we mean by all these terms. Standards, especially, we have to promote a lot because people are used to doing things their own way, uh, putting the cart before the horse. They produce and then hope that it will meet requirements. But we have to make sure that people understand standards and what part it plays in their processing. Then it comes to the affordability of the conformity assessment um, requirements. Would they be able to afford it? Now, most of the laboratories and even the inspection bodies are going through um, accreditation. They've, they've been certified to some of these standards. What do we do to ensure that the conformity, as service, uh, conformity assessment um, services would be affordable? to people who have whose businesses are not even too capital intensive and then assessing it most of the these services are very dense in the capital so what about those in the interior places how do we get it to them then for those who are doing the right thing what protection do we give them because there'll be others who will not be doing the right thing. So enforcement, we need to make sure that enforcement to be affordable. We also have cases of porous borders. How do we make sure that everybody does, I mean, goes through the right channel? There's the barrier, language barrier. Across Africa, we are speaking English, we are speaking French, Kiswahili, Portuguese, Arabic and other languages. How do we ensure that these do not become barriers or do not be cause traders to be disadvantaged? Advantage. Joyce, and the list goes on and on. Non-compatibility, for instance, of the custom processes or procedures. How do we ensure all these things are harmonized to ensure that trade will go on smoothly? Um, I think I should stop here, but there's still so many yes. more challenges that we are facing as a country. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, so much for insights into the challenges. And I'm sure we will all take a cue from how Ghana is uh, managing the various challenges. And uh, I hope your doors will be open for members to contact you directly to be able to pick up um, some of the tips you have given us and then make them, you know, leverage on what Ghana is doing and uh, replicate what is uh, what they can do in their various countries. Thank you so much. And yeah. I'd like to move on to the the last speaker. Fortunately, we're running out of time, but um, it's been an interesting uh, time with um, members. So I'd like to introduce um, engineer Daniel Sechi Pachi. He's the managing director, Danes Engineering Company Limited. He, he, it's an operator of Welder Training and Testing Center based in Takradi. Um, it's for welder skill training and qualification testing in, um, I can see all of these um, <laughs> areas. And he also offers technical training in welding and allied processes, welding consulting and inspection, preparation of welding procedure, specification, and the list goes on. It's a very specialized area and we have very few experts in this area. So we are happy to welcome engineer Kwache to present his topic, which is making the most of the AFCFTA and benefiting from the AFCFTA trade opportunities and economies of scale, positioning of the African private sector in the AFCFTA. I warmly welcome you, engineer Kwache, to make your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. And I want to start my presentation by sharing my screen first. Uh, 
All right, if the screen is clear, if it's okay with uh, everybody, then I yes, think- Yes, it's I... clear. You can go back. All right, okay. And maybe um, if you, it's just one slide or- I'm No, seeing... it's five of them, this is the first one. Okay, from here it's, sure, okay. Kindly go ahead. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I am privileged. In fact, I am so content to be on this panel on behalf of the private sector and to talk about benefiting from the after trade opportunities and economies of scale positioning. of the African private sector in the Squatchy. I'm an American Welding Society certified welding inspector. And I run a company, the Danest Engineering Company. We operate an ISO 17,025 accredited mechanical metallurgical testing laboratory, and then a welder training test uh, center. in Takradi, Ghana. In talking about this, how benefits and opportunities are there for them. I just want, I want to include all businesses that operate within the manufacturing, the construction services and supplies industries. And so when we heard of after, having the executive uh, in Ghana, um, we were so excited at uh, the prospect. I mean, it was talked about on several occasions, but the actualization, when we heard about that, we got excited. Then we became more excited because we found out that uh, some of our colleagues will be able to uh, enter into a huge market. And through that, they will be able to expand their production capacity, will be able to employ more people. And what is seen for us is that some of us cannot be operated after flat platform, but we can help these businesses to meet their Yes, some of these companies who will not be who will be assembled all over the world to do the construction and facility and equipment, and even provision of conformity assessment services that include a certification, inspection, testing, and calibration. So everybody was excited when we heard about this. Two years down the line, after it has been signed, and then after local office has been set up, we see that only a few companies are able to meet and then to log on to this after form trading. I understand an alcoholic beverage manufacturer, a ceramic type producer, and a cosmetic supplier have been able to at least uh, get onto the platform for trading. And I've also gathered information that some SMEs are garnering support and then trying to get rolled onto this great trading platform. That's very good. But as it stands now, um, those in the private sector have not seen much in this. So then the question is, what's wrong? What are the challenges you know, in exploiting the after opportunities? The challenges, I'll just talk about two here because of time. The first one is that, you see, um, the, my predecessors, those who have spoken, they've spoken a lot, they've gone deep. But if we don't put all these things together to direct maybe um, a practitioner or someone who is to do business with after to understand, it, it becomes something different. So we clearly 
have not seen an identifiable national body that will be responsible for standardization, accreditation, conformity, a setup of conformity assessment bodies, compliance, and even making an input into uh, the current national industry policy action. Maybe that one, the industry policy action is a document that emanates from the Minister for Trade that will tell the whole nation that this year, 2023, this is what we have planned to do. Now, we'll do leather work, we'll do car export, we'll do this amounting to this. Then industries and individuals can look at that and then make a plan. So now that is not so clear with us now. The second one is about the absence of an identifiable national regulator. You see, the policymaker in this case is different from the regulator because the regulator is the one, it's not the one who will make the standards, who will do accreditation, who will do conformity assessment, no. The national regulator is there to ensure and enforce that all parties and stakeholders, including the clients, the contractors, the service providers and suppliers, they all operate within a regulatory framework and they ensure that there's a level playing field for all operators to carry out their activities according to governing standards, the standards that have been agreed upon, which I know ASO and other bodies are working on. And by so doing, they, they protect the public in terms of uh, good quality, value for money, in terms of health and safety, and in terms of the safe use of the environment. You know, right now, as I speak with you, some companies are already operating with this, um, within this environment for the oil and gas industries and so on. They, they, they work very much to international standards, international accreditation, and then strict uh, uh, conformity assessment. We, we do that work. On the after, from what I've heard today, it means that we are trying to build these things up and then to help um, um, uh, the private sector to be able to partake of this successfully. Well, what support would we need or do we require so that we can, the private sector can fully gain from the after? All I will say at this time is that, yes, we've heard a lot. All the big people have said so many things. There are a lot of them. They are very, very good. But to the ordinary man, ordinary private sector man, how do you put all these together and get them informed, educated, and trained to successfully roll onto this program and make some money out. You, you recognize that. There are certain things about after that uh, bothered to know. Is it true that anybody who first rolls onto that must be must have a management system that conforms to ISO 9001? What is the cost of being ISO uh, 9001 certified by an external conformity assessment? But, and then also under the, um, the, the sustainable development goals. And if you look at that, they talk about standards accreditation of ensuring confidence in governments, confidence in the suppliers, and even the end users. I don't think after in putting after documents together for trading within the African bloc. We have to be mindful of that document as well. Yes, we have to be mindful of that in the sense that by that document, it states that all the standards must come from the uh, ISO IEC. Yes, and that the accreditation body must have gone through
do peer review with the IEF and ILA and the um, authority to accredit conformity assessment bodies to perform the certification inspection and then to do the testing as in my laboratory and then calibrations. Uh, in some of the industries that we deal with right now, in fact, you go there and you hold any other thing done to any other standard that is not within the ISO IEC. So we have to look at the, what ASO is doing right now. That it doesn't deviate so much from the international standard. So that if we have the international standards, I know it covers what Africa needs and it even covers what individual nations need. So we have to be very careful that we don't do any other, any other okay, we don't, we don't Africanize the whole thing too much to be okay for only what we want to do over here. We must open it up. So then, in conclusion, what would I say? Help us. The stakeholders' capacity building. It should be often. We need a lot more of it. In fact, I have been in this business for more than uh, 20 years now. But today's presentation has given me a lot to think about and then a lot to help me in running my business. So I will just say that more of this involve the private sector, policymakers, the regulators, then the accredited conformity assessment body. Yes, we could get so many conformity assessment bodies performing all sorts of testing and so on, but they should be the accredited ones. They have been assessed and audited against those standards. So when they say this, it is a third party uh, thing. It doesn't belong to the contractor or the uh, client. No, it is neutral, a third party. We need those conformity assessment bodies in the system. And then we also need the national standards and accreditation bodies. This must be set up to help businesses to be able to meet needs. And when such meetings are held, um, the standards, as we have come to know today, the accreditation process that are required for the effective participation of every business and the enrollment or the after platform will be discussed. I think from then on, we can increase the number of uh, companies or private sector people who are operating on this uh, after platform. I think I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer Pachi, for the insightful submission representing the private sector. Um, the key benefits and opportunities for the private sector is well highlighted. Opportunities to trade within a larger market, um, mm -hmm. opportunity to expand production. You basically have answered all my questions. Um, the negotiated reduced tariffs, which is a plus. And then our key challenges, which is well acknowledged and mainly the quality infrastructure components, standardization, accreditation, conformity assessment bodies, and indeed compliance to standards and regulations. And uh, you highlighted on challenges, um, that the absence of a national regulator, which is indeed uh, a key issue to be addressed, because basically the national regulator is going to regulate that sector which is a, a quiet and a, a unique area, which we don't have that much expertise um, and keep you really treating. And uh, I noted the um, support, mainly capacity building in the private sector for policy makers and regulators, and indeed the accredited conformity assessment bodies to handle um, most of the issues. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for the insights and I'm sure um, participants have picked a lot from you and um, would also go back and then see how we can make use of the information that we have gathered today. Indeed, it has been loaded and um, I, I can say that um, 
it's been very, very useful. And um, a lot, I can see quite a number of comments in the chats as well. And our key takeaways from each panelist would also be very essential. So if you have to say just a statement that we will take away and go and see how we can leverage on it, what would it be? I would suggest that all panelists would give us their key takeaways and then would bring the meeting to the people. So I'll start with Ruben. Ruben, if you can just give us your key takeaway for the session and uh, we'll leverage on that and then we'll move on to the other speakers. Thank you very much, Eugene Apache. I will get back to you soon. Thank you. Yeah, um, I thank you very much, uh, Joyce, for the moderation. And then I thank all the other panelists for their inputs. Indeed, what we are, it's evident that we all want to sail in one ship that is uh, headed in the right direction. And in that sense, uh, I would urge that uh, as much as possible, we actually participate uh, in the harmonization of the standards, as well as uh, ensuring that we can harmonize or have equivalent technical regulations and support the training of experts who does who do the certification and those that can carry out the audits so that we have a pool of these people who can assist our continent to lower the costs of certification and accreditation. And uh, to assure our colleague, the last speaker, that uh, what we are doing in the continent is not an Africanization of the standards and a conformity assessment, but rather to ensure that those areas that are neglected by the international systems have the relevant uh, standards, the relevant certification schemes, the relevant conformity assessment uh, capabilities so that these products can, can access markets in the continent as well as at the global level. Uh, indeed, and I think uh, for me, uh, what we really require is focusing on ensuring that we can make the FCFTA work for us as is anticipated in the uh, in uh, uh, in the agenda 2063 uh, of the African Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very good summary of um, what we can take away with us. Indeed. We started with standards harmonization. It was slow at the beginning, but then we started gaining speed and we've done quite a lot in that area. And so it's just uh, okay that we now move to the implementation of these standards. And then uh, first of all, well, you have to do your national adoptions and we want to encourage member countries to adopt you know, our standards and then move on to the implementation and then all the other factors coming. So thank you so much, Rubin. And we'll move on to Mr. Chou Komi to give us um, his takeaway. Mr. Komi, please. Thanks. Uh, this has been quite an uh, interesting discussion and uh, also learned a lot from what's going on in, uh, in Ghana. Um, and I really do hope that uh, um, most of the participants here will also push from their end, respective countries, to also um, implement this EFCFTA in an integrated manner. And as I said, uh, UNDP to our country officers and regional teams, we, we are ready to provide support to businesses and others and uh, market uh, compliance to, to standards are some of the priorities we want to focus on. But uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and looking forward for more engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Komi. Um, we'll now move on to Jessica in Kansa to give us our takeaway for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joyce. Um, I'm very glad actually to be part of this workshop and um, I'm happy that we're able to share our experiences as a country with everybody present here. 
there is no point in reinventing a wheel which works well. And we are ready to share whatever help we can with anybody who wants help. We're also prepared actually to learn from others as well. And our doors would always be open for us to help. And especially with the president being from our institution, I'm sure whatever help that is needed, I mean, would be very readily available to other standards organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica. Indeed, we would lean on each other to be able to move the process forward for the benefit of Africa. So we all have to, you know, leverage on each other and uh, make use of whatever capacities are available around the continent and then take advantage of it from our member states. Thank you. So we move on to the last but not the least. Um, Engineer Kwachi, you can just give us a final takeaway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, being part of this um, discussion. My concluding point will be that whatever it is, trading in international organizations like uh, AFTA would demand three main pillars, which everybody has talked about today. That is the standards, the accreditation, and then the conformity assessment. Now, I'm sure we're going to look at this holistically. And at the same time, we shouldn't leave out the timelines. See, if we have all the time to ourselves to do these things, it takes too much. For example, now that um, we are harmonizing this, the harmonization of after these standards we're talking about has taken some time now. How long more? When is it going to be done? In the interim, when we don't have the harmonized version, what happens? What, how do we treat? You know, so uh, these are all there for us to tackle. And I'm sure from this, we all play our part to make sure that we we'll reach the goal of getting so many of our people on the after platform and make some money out of it for our people. Thank you. Thank you very much for your concluding remarks. Indeed, we would have to move the process forward. And uh, um, I'd like to um, thank all the panelists. Indeed, it has been so full. There's so much information that we have gathered today. And uh, I'd like to highlight on what um, Pomi mentioned, the UNDP support. That was a key area that caught my mind. I think that member countries should reach out to him and look for whatever support we would need in our various countries. And uh, I'm sure he can share his details with member countries in the chat box so that um, we can reach out to him and see how um, you can access the, the support that's available by the UNDP. So I thank you all members and participants that have joined. And um, I would like to say that this has been an impressive participation. And uh, let's take note of the fact that the opportunities are vast and we need to take advantage of them. And I'd like to also mention what the president of ASU mentioned, that is uh, moving the AFCFT forward and faster. It looks like it's dragging and it's because there's so many, you know, components to it. And then we are all coming, bringing, getting uh, accustomed to the new um, um, Africa, if I can put it that way. But we need to accelerate the process so that we can get the full benefits timelessly. So I would like to get back to Nadine to give us the closing remarks and thank all the participants that um, 
I, I can say a very impressive uh, uh, participation today. So Nadine, you have the mic. Mm -hmm. I thank, oh, of course, uh, I want to thank the technical team, Dan and uh, Philip. They've been excellent to me here. <laughs> I'm very grateful to them. <laughs> okay, so Nadine, you have the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam Moderator, uh, Joyce Okore. I think we forgot to tell the participants that you are the acting director of the of standards at the Ghana Standard Authority, and you really did a good job uh, today, and uh, you moderated well the way you intervened after and by summarizing all the presentations. It was really good. I, I, on behalf of the, of the Secretary General, I wish to thank everyone who has joined this webinar and uh, the fruitful comments uh, through the chat. We really appreciate and uh, this is recorded for future use and in case of anything, we will respond to the chat through your email because everyone who has um, uh, joined us uh, today, we have his or her email address. So in case of any issue um, which has um, escaped our site, we will respond to it through email. And um, I would also take this opportunity to thank our, our speakers, panelists, uh, who did um, really um, match the, the, the presentations uh, with the topic of today. It really helped us to understand what is going on around the AFCFTA. And now uh, we, we think that um, we are on a, on a, on a better uh, position compared to um, three hours before. So now I let us see what the future results for us. Um, in May, I would uh, like to tell you that you kindly book uh, this date, the 24th May, where we will be having another webinar uh, co-hosted by uh, ASO with Tanzania Bureau of Standards. This will talk about standardization and SMEs. It will be a, a good opportunity to understand and recognize the, the vital role of SMEs as an engine, um, uh, as engines for sustainable and inclusive economic growth. So I can also invite you to the General Assembly, this General Assembly, ASO 29th ASO General Assembly event will be uh, hosted by the government of the, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, from the 3rd to the 7th of July. Uh, that will be in Kinshasa. Uh, we will be having um, good events, including the Made in Africa Expo. So here we will also have so many other events, such as the training of uh, ASO technical committee experts, conformity assessment expert, consumer experts, and also we will award the winners of the essay competition. So this is... Uh, what I should, I can just say you, and um, once more, I thank everyone for, for having joined us today. Thank you very much. And um, if at the end, we cannot forget to showcase what GSA has, uh, has reached. Uh, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's an organization which started a long time ago with a lot of experience, and now the way they exchange with uh, uh, different partners, uh, stakeholders and, uh, and uh, at national and international level. So these are the, some of the outreach activities at the GSA, as you can see. So thank you very much, GSA, for hosting us. Thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, Prof. Alex Dodu, for allowing us and giving us this opportunity to follow this wonderful um, uh, event of today and uh, we wish to, uh, wish that uh, the next event with TBS will also be successful as this one. Thank you very much everyone. Uh, Dan and uh, Philip also thank you very much for 
for keeping us live through Facebook and uh, and uh, and uh, YouTube and providing us this uh, platform. I can uh, ask everyone connected to open the camera so that we have a, a, a photo. Yeah. Open the camera. Then are you taking us the picture? I'm waiting for <laughs> okay. I'm waiting for the members to. But uh, but participants, a smile. <laughs> 